so good evening everyone today i'll be discussing about covid vaccines in children the current concepts so what i really plan to discuss today would be what are the uh, need what is the need safety and efficacy of currently available covid vaccines especially the one that is available in india now and also some recent evidences and controversies and some daily dilemmas regarding covid vaccine now we all know that mortality in children due to covid is extremely low and whatever mortality we see it is usually in children with comorbidities so but there is also a small proportion or subset of children who experience long covid in the form of headache fatigue disturbed sleep or problems in concentrating so that is important for us similarly there has been some reports of fulminant hepatic failure secondary to adenoviral infections and there has been a postulation that it is probably due to SARS-CoV-2 viruses persisting in your intestine acting as a super antigens leading on to this increased virulence of adenovirus causing the hepatic injury. So this is not conclusively being proved so you would require further evidence to refute or uh, accept the postulation but anyway it is being considered. On the other side we also know that different waves of COVID have infected children differently. Some waves or some mutations have been associated with more symptomatic cases and some have been associated with less symptomatic cases. Same is the case of MISC also. So we do not know exactly whether the future, future mutations would make children more susceptible or less susceptible. So coming to that, when you have some reasons why you want to give the COVID vaccine in children, then the question arises, what is the efficacy of these vaccines? Why is it that vaccinated people are getting infection? Yes, one of the important cause is definitely mutation because the original vaccine has been made against the original strain and it has mutated subsequently. Then also waning antibody level is also an important reason. But also we have to remember that whatever vaccines currently we have are all killed vaccines. And when you have killed vaccines, they're administered through the parenteral route. So the mucosal immune response is less. What does that mean? That means you will get the infection. The virus will multiply in your upper respiratory tract. You will have upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. But as far as infecting your main organs, your lung, your heart, etc., is considered, that is why we say that vaccines mainly protect against severe disease and hospital admissions. We all know that vaccine efficacy decreases over time. And we also know that vaccine efficacy depends on strain. The vaccines which were highly effective against the Delta strain were comparatively lesser effective against the Omicron strain. But what is interesting to notice that here in this interesting study published recently in JAMA, they had assessed for neutralizing antibody response against SARS-CoV-2 variant. And what they found that for the original Wuhan strain, it was highly effective or there was a good antibody response. For the Delta strain, also reasonably good antibody response was there. But unfortunately, when it came to Omicron, especially after six to seven months, there was hardly any response, very less response. But when the booster dose was given, you can see it is almost close to 100% response. So, and the same thing that you can see it here in the numbers also, you can see that the booster is associated with close to 39-fold increase in neutralizing antibody response. So that is why vaccine boosters appear to reduce, even in case of Omicron, hospitalization and infection. So boosters are important. This is nothing new for us pediatricians because we know that when you take a primary dose of two to three doses, we are expecting the antibody titers to come down, especially with killed vaccine, non-replicating antigens. But after six or seven months, it's when you give the booster, you get a far higher titer and more sustained rise of antibodies. So boosters are important in COVID, just like it is important in other conditions. So now comes the question, how many boosters? As far as India is considered, we were giving single booster that too initially after nine months. Now the recent government guideline is that you can give a booster after six months for those above 18 years of age. So India, we are giving only boosters at present to those over 18 years of age. Whereas CDC is recommending booster for all above five years of age. They have also gone one step ahead, telling that those who are immunocompromised, they require three primary doses and also 
two boosters if the person is above 12 years of age. So can, so the, another important question that we all were bothered about is can vaccination cause MISE? Remember, MISE following vaccination, the risk is extremely rare, 0.3 case per million. Similarly, in case of children less than 12 years of age, the incidence of myocarditis following vaccination is also extremely rare. In this particular study of more than 2,55,000 children in Israel, they found that only 12 developed myocarditis, which in fact was less than the background rate of myocarditis that normally happens even before the COVID infection came. So less than 12 years, vaccine-induced myocarditis also seems to be extremely rare. Now comes the question. Can vaccine protect against MISE? If it's not causing MISE, can it protect against MISE? Yes. The recent evidences, both from France as well as from US, shows that vaccines have 91% efficacy against, against development of MISE and almost 100% efficacy against MISE leading on to requirement of a life support. So that is why CDC has come out with this IEC telling you that vaccination decreases MISE by 91%. 95% of adolescents who are hospitalized with MISE are unvaccinated and no vaccinated MISE patient require life support. So that is good news. But what about the major adverse events that we had heard or we are still hearing following the introduction of COVID vaccine, namely GBS, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, and vaccine-induced myocarditis. Regarding GBS, you need to know that vector vaccines does cause an increased incidence of, uh, of GBS. That is just as you expect whenever we come out with a mass viral vaccination, live viral vaccination, uh, it will always, usually it is preceded, it is uh, followed by an increased incidence of GBS that has been in the experience previously also. So this time also, we did have an increase in the rate of GBS following vector vaccines because e there a vector is a live vector. You have an adenovirus, even though it dies off soon after it enters your body after delivering the genetic material, but nevertheless, while being administered, it is a live virus. And that is one of the reasons why you did have an increased incidence of GBS following Covishield vaccination. The same is the case for vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Again, this is a complication following vector vaccines seen mainly in females between 30 to 50 years of age. And we should know that this particular side effect as well as GBS is usually seen after the first dose of the vaccine and not the subsequent doses or the boosters. So those who have already got the vaccine and have not experienced the side effect, they needn't worry about the boosters as of now. Now, what about COVID-19 vaccine and myocarditis? This is one of the side, rare side, very rare side effects, but which has been reported following RNA vaccine. Most of the myocarditis has been mild. The onset of symptoms averaging around three years, three days after receiving the vaccination. And most of them required an admission for say two to three days. So they were mild cases of myocarditis, which recovered off its own. But here you have to see that it is usually seen after the second dose and especially in young adults. So what is what do we understood from these three major side effects? If a child has history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, please avoid giving a Covishield vaccine or a vector vaccine like Janssen vaccine to the child. Even the, for mRNA vaccine, there has not no reports of recurrence of GBS following receipt of it. Then if a patient is higher prone for thrombosis, uh, like say a female between the 30 to 50 year of age group, someone with previous history of heparin induced hit thrombocytopenia or previous history of thrombosis, it would be preferable to avoid a vector vaccine. And when it comes to uh, myocarditis following mRNA vaccine for those at risk, that is adolescents about 12 years of age, 12 to 30, 40 years is the high risk group. And that is why this group, now it is recommended that the second dose, instead of taking after three or four weeks, it needs to be taken after eight to 12 weeks. It is to ensure that the risk of myocarditis comes down further. So this was the vaccines in general. Now, what are the vaccines which are currently available in India as of July, 2022? So currently these are the five vaccines which are available in India out of which we know that 
you have Covaxin, which can be given for children between 15 to 18 years of age, Corbivax, which can be given for those between 12 to 14 years of age, and Covax is now available in the private sector, which can be given for everyone above 12 years of age. So new, you have to also see that these vaccines can be given for children less than 12 years of age in the sense that uh, DCGA, the Drug Controller General of India, has given the green signal, has given the license, but the uh, National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization has still not given the green signal. That is why these vaccines or none of the vaccines currently are being given to children less than 12 years of age in India. So as of July 2022, it is mainly for children about 12 years of age, even though three vaccines are licensed for less than 12 years of age. So we would be expecting them to come out soon. Now, there are other vaccines like Zykov D, Moderna, Johnson, Johnson, Sputnik vaccine, and a recently um, launched mRNA vaccine in, from India, manufactured in India, which has not yet reached the market. So he, these vaccines are also approved by DCGI, but has not reached the market yet. Now, there have been some recent reports that vaccine efficacy depends on age. Children above 12 years seem to respond better to the vaccines than children less than five years of age. But we should note that this particular study is mainly using the Pfizer vaccine where children less than 12 years are given a smaller dose of the vaccine. That may be one of the reasons why you are seeing a lesser efficacy. And regarding CoronaVac, which should be similar or something similar, platform is similar to our Covaxin, that's the killed vaccine, which is showing 70% protection against ICU admissions and 65% protection against hospitalization in children as small as three to five years of age group. Now, regarding the vaccine platforms, so we all are aware, aware of the killed vaccine, Covaxin, and the vector vaccine, Covishield. Now we have a newer edition that is the subunit vaccine, Covovax or Corbivax. Now, what exactly is a subunit vaccine? Subunit vaccine means by genetic recombinant technology, you are making the spike proteins. These spike proteins are harvested. They are combined with an adjuvant and it is used as a vaccine. So there is no whole live vaccine. There is no whole killed vaccine. There is no genetic material. It is just the spike protein combined with an adjuvant. So it has an excellent safety profile because this is something we are aware of. Your HPV vaccine, your hepatitis B vaccine, they are all subunit vaccines. So similarly, Covovax and Corbivax are also subunit vaccine currently being advocated for children above 12 years, even though licensed for those above seven years. Two doses needs to be given three weeks apart. Whereas in Corbivox, it is again two doses, four weeks apart. So dose schedule is easy to remember. All the three vaccines are two doses, three to four weeks apart. That is Covaxin, Covovax, and Corbivax, vaccines which are being used in children. Now, when you want to compare between these three vaccines, you would realize that seroconversion rate of Covishield is far higher than the seroconversion rate of Covaxin. But when you look at the breakthrough infection, in fact, Covaxin is doing good. It is not inferior to Covishield. When it comes to a side effect profile, definitely Covaxin has a better side effect profile than Covishield. But when you look at the Corbivax or Covovax, whatever data we have, it shows that it has a good seroconversion as well as a good um, high neutralizing antibody titers and also no major adverse effects. So they seem to be having a good efficacy combined with lesser side effects. Now coming to the other question, what about children who have experienced the inflammatory storm of MISC? What are the questions that you would like to know for a child who has already experienced MISC? Do they need COVID vaccines? If they need, when do you want to give? Will reinfection cause reoccurrence of MISC? And what about routine vaccination? The answer is there are no large scale studies about reinfection following MISC, but there are definitely a couple of case reports which are reporting that reinfection with COVID uh, virus is not associated with reappearance of MISC symptoms. So that is something good for us. So if you want to give a um, um, COVID vaccine for a child who has already experienced MISC, take, give it only three months after MISC if the child continues to be in a high risk for infection. And at the same time, ensure that there has been complete recovery, including a normal cardiac function before you decide on giving the vaccine. 
Now coming to what about routine vaccination. As far as skilled vaccines are considered, you can give. But as far as live vaccines are considered, you are using immunosuppressing agents or immunomodulating agents. So you need to have an interval or you need to have a plan for live vaccines. If the patient was a case of mild MISC and you were giving only steroid for 2 mg per kg, that too for less than two weeks, then you can vaccinate when the child is off steroids. That means you've stopped the steroids, you can give the vaccine. If the patient is treated with high dose steroids, say methylprednisolone pulse, 10 to 30 mg per kg for three days, followed by 2 mg per kg steroid, that means your total course of steroid would be definitely more than two weeks. So in that scenario, you have to wait for one month after stopping steroids to give a live vaccine. So we are talking about routine vaccine and MISC patients. Now, what about patients treated with IVIG? The patient is treated with IVIG, you live vaccines can be given only 11 months after the receipt of IVIG. If you have given 2 gram per kg, if it is 1 gram per kg, you can give it after 8 months. We need to understand that if a child who has received IVIG receives a live vaccine early, it does not harm the child, but it is not efficacious. That is why you are asking for a period of 11 months. Now, can we give other vaccines, could COVID vaccine? Because now the COVID vaccine has come down to the children, pediatric age group. So that means children are otherwise also receiving a lot of vaccines. So can you combine these two vaccines together? When first the COVID vaccine was launched, it was advocated that any vaccine should not be combined with COVID vaccine and there should be an interval of two weeks. But now we should understand it is behaving like just any other vaccine. So there is no need for any interval. You can give COVID vaccine along with any other routine vaccine, be it a rabies vaccine, be it a, uh, your DM, TT or TD, any vaccine, it can be given. So we need to know, and there has been studies where they have seen whether giving Novovax and seasonal influenza vaccine, whether that interferes with the immunogenicity efficacy, it has been found it doesn't interfere. So routine vaccines can be combined along with routine, with the COVID vaccine as of now, according to CDC. India, uh, the, M, the Ministry of Health has not come out with any updation recently. So our recommendations, newer recommendations haven't come as far as India is considered. Now, what about mix and match? That is the flavor of the season, right? So here you should know that we all know that mixing is better. That is what they say. But what about most of us? Most of us have taken COVID shield vaccine. So which vaccine would you like to mix and mix and match and how does it respond? So here you can see in this study, they have see, they have done it with homologous boosting. That is booster again was Covishield or they have boosted it with an mRNA vaccine or they have boosted it with a subunit vaccine that is Novavax. Here you can see that the antibody titer was far higher when the boosting happened with an mRNA vaccine. But even after a Novavax vaccine, also the antibody titer was far higher compared to homologous booster with the COVID shield. So that means if you want to give a booster, it is good to have a heterologous booster. That is different vaccine for a booster. But what is interesting to note is that when they looked at the cellular response, in fact, Novavax was doing better than, slightly better, you can say, than, uh, than mRNA. So when it comes to uh, cellular response, that means Novavax is not at all inferior. So that is good news for us. So what does the world body say? So now we understood that heterologous boosting is good and heterologous boosting studies are underway in India of booster doses with uh, Novavax. So the reports, we are waiting for the results. So what does the, meanwhile, the world body says? The WHO says that you can mix and match even for the primary schedule or for the booster schedule. CDC recommends that when you're using the primary schedule, that is the first two or three doses should be the same vaccine. You should not do a mix and match there. But booster, you can do a mix and match. When it comes to the Ministry of Health, it says that as of now, they are not recommending heterologous booster. They are recommending only homologous booster and that too for individual above 18 years of age. They're expecting these recommendations to change in the coming months or years. So the final take home message, use every opportunity to offer routine, routine immunization. No definite interval needed between COVID vaccine and other vaccines. Preferable to wait for minimum of three months after MISC for COVID vaccine. Avoid COVID shield in patients with risk of GBS and HIT. And Covovax, Corbivax, and Covaxin, which are currently being used in children less than 18 years of age 
as of now is showing excellent safety profile. Thank you.